Hey Fabricators, welcome back to Advancing Fabric, where today we're diving into another one of the fabric experiences. So we've done videos before looking at One Lake, we've had a look at the warehousing experience, but we've not yet had a look at the data engineering experience, and that is the bit that's caught in my heart as a sparky person. So we'll be digging into that, looking at how we create a notebook, how we use the starter pools, how we actually get going writing Spark, and why you should be writing Spark inside a fabric. That is the plan for today. As always, if you're new around here, don't forget to like and subscribe. Let us know down in the comments if you're using Fabric already, what you're using it for, what you'd like to use it for. It'd be great to hear kind of how people are positioning it in their heads currently. Now, it's been a couple of weeks since we last did a Fabric video. Now, that is because a certain person, who is our chief fabricator, took some holiday very rudely. Okay, you're back from holiday. Go on, rid of the specs. Glasses off. Yeah, okay. Welcome back, Craig. Thank you. Good to be back. Refreshed, ready to go. Good. Can you can you remember how everything works? Yes. Lots yes. changed though. It's always updating, <laughs> so need to keep up to date. All right. So I'm driving today. It could it being a sparky thing, but you're just gonna tell me where to go, tell me where to click, tell me what I'm doing, and kind of just guide this experience as I go and just build a notebook, right? Yep. Sounds good. Cool. So I'm gonna start off by diving into the data engineering world. Makes sense. Yep. Get that. Uh, we've got a lot yeah. of stuff going on, and then we were in the we we're in our previous uh, workspace, right? We had our UK sales workspace. Yeah, so we're going to jump over to the UK sales workspace. Before you move over there, this kind of home screen gives you uh, those options of what you can actually create within your um, data engineering experience. I'm pointing that out because this is the only place where you can import a notebook. Uh, to where you're actually going to your your workspace so you need to do it from here you can't do it once you kind of get into that experience and drop down from the kind of new item uh, menu but yep let's jump over to the workspace uk sales right. cool. we've got a few things in here you've got the, the various lake houses and warehouses that we've created in the past uh we do have some notebooks already but we're going to create a new notebook right yeah yeah let's start with a new one we can import some data Big old list of stuff that we can do, and we're going to go and do notebook. Cool. All right. What do we need to do? So this is your kind of notebook experience, your interface, but you'll probably see this kind of bar down the side here that's just giving you the option to add a lake house. So you can actually add a new one or one that's existing just to give you that kind of default location where you're working with. So we can use our existing bronze uh, lake house. And you've got all those options in there. And that just gives us somewhere where we can actually work with uh, our lake house data. Cool. So it's a bit like setting setting a context. If you're in a SQL server, that's setting your default database, the kind of thing that you're currently yeah. working in. Uh, and the way Fabric always works, we've got our tables, which are our nice you know, registered SQL side of things. And we've got our files, which are our just collections of files. It makes sense. Yes. Yet to be put into a table. Exactly, yeah. Cool. All right. So we're so, going to we're going to essentially grab some of those files, turn it into a table, and then add it into our list of tables. We're doing our little getting our first things into raw so we can play with it, right? Yeah, exactly. So we can use this notebook to import that data from the the source files that we have there. We can add some metadata to it, um, do any transformations if we want to, and bring that through into our Bronze Lake House. Um, now, there is a kind of another option, another way to, to approach this as well, is if you go just above that Lake House Explorer option, there's another button there, which just allows you to see essentially your resources. So if you click on that, um, that's our notebook resources. So this is like a small holding area, a pocket, if you will, where you can bring in some ad hoc data files. Um, you can work with some bits and pieces. And if you're like creating a model in, in your notebook, you can kind of pull some of that out as well. Um, it's just, there's a few limitations around it. You're kind of limited to 500 meg there um, and some file limitations, but it's just a little bit of a, a kind of scratch pad working area. Okay, but yeah, more for experimentation things. You wouldn't really build your like data engineering exactly. proper workflows yeah. using it. Yeah, yeah, you okay. want to be focusing on pulling that from your your lake house from your actual uh, kind of core storage there. That's really just like a place to uh, to play or put things for kind of ad hoc working. Cool. All right, makes sense. 
Uh, and then what else we got? So we're in, we're in Python currently. We have got the the usual languages that you can write uh, Spark in. Plus C sharp is still around from uh, the Synapse days. Which is cool. Uh, so we can come and write something. So let's just open a data frame and have yep. a quick play on some of that data. Now, when I came in here, I originally wanted to kind of just come and drag my little folder, but my folder's not there. I can't do that. It makes me sad. But we can just grab Spark file, drag it in. And that's then written a just a general spark.read for us so we can go and actually sort of bring that in. Got that full location. So we did that. We're not currently connected to a session. We've not picked anything. We're using all the defaults for that workspace. Uh, yep. And there we go. Starting session. Three, four, five seconds. Running cell. Ah, spark clusters yep. are just the start. Makes me happy. Um, yeah, so... Under the hood there, you've got the the kind of starter pool that's kind of uh, set up by default for you, and that's just allowing you to kind of get up and running nice and fast. Um, if you want to change that, if you want to kind of create a custom pool, and we can go into a lot more detail of that in another video, but that's all set at the workspace level. So that's under your workspace settings where you can actually um, select a different pool, create a different one, depending on your, your options, set a different runtime as well. Cool. Yeah, that makes sense. So... That's going to a particular file. We never do that in Spark. No one ever, ever <laughs> does that. Do that. Get rid of that file. That's now going across the fo uh, whole folder. So that's just querying all of the various different Parquet files we had in there, now treating it as a single data set. Well, that's the kind of thing we'd normally do in ETL. Other things we'd normally do in ETL. Give me a second. I'm going to say, uh, so df.select expr. Got a nice IntelliSense type down working. Take all the existing columns and then add a secret column called metadata. A little sparky trick, um, which just tells you which essentially it appends a new column into your data. So you can then go and have a look and say, well, where did that actually come from? So we can go and see everything now has this thing saying, what was the original file path? What's the file name? How big was it? All that stuff appended to every record. So if we are selecting across a whole bunch of Parquet files, we get the lineage tracked in terms of where everything came from, just at the yeah. record level, which is just something we generally do. Uh, and then the final thing, we'd want to write that down to a table. So we can do data frame dot right. Do the formats of delta. We'll do a mode of overwrite. And I'm going to do save as table. We we'll necessarily always do out in the Spark world because it makes it a managed table. But actually in Fabric that kind of makes sense. We want it to be part of these tables. We're saying we'll make mm -hmm. it one of these tables up here. And say well, it's going to be uh, as part of our, our UK sales of bronze. It could be part of UK sales. Whoops. I think. Uh, and then it can be called Worldwide Importers, I guess. And then this is Dimension yeah. City. Something like that. And that'll go through. That'll write my table down. Save it as part of my lake house. And then uh, once I refresh this, I should then be able to see that just as written to my lake house. A couple of lines yeah. of code to pick some data up, append some columns to it, write it down. Fairly straightforward. Yeah, exactly. And even though like we've selected that UK sales bronze as our default um, lake house attached to this notebook, we can still use that two part naming to reference our other uh, layers or other lake houses to say UK sales underscore silver, for example, and write out to that location. Yeah. So that's really good. To yeah, refresh this over here. There we go. WI Dimension City. We've now got that so we can actually write out to that table. Fair enough. Easy. Um, the reason I wanted to do like a little bit of classical ETL stuff is for anyone who's watching this who isn't coming from the Spark side of things, looking at this going, how do I do Spark inside Fabric? Or people who are doing coming from the Fabric side of things going, why would I use Spark? What's the point of using Spark? Well, I'm going to grab that same code, but just wrapped in a little... Um, essentially, because this is Python, we can write a little iterator. We can say for each thing in this loop of things, do another thing. I could just add a new cell down here and go. So actually, I want to have a list of folders. So inside here, I've got my city, customer, date, employee, stock item folder. And then for each thing in that list of things, go and read that data, do the same, add that metadata thing, and then write it down as that new file. I'm going to uncomment that. I'm going to just run that. And that's going to go in a loop and load all of my tables. So I'm loading one, one, two, three, four, five tables as a single script that I don't have to worry about. It's like the most basic bit of ETL automation you can think of. Yeah. But 
suddenly I'm not having to create a new pipeline every time I'm adding a table. I'm not having to create a new script, a new SQL script every time I'm writing a table. I can just build something. Oh, I mentioned. <laughs> but that's fine <laughs> because it's automated. We can redo that really easily. Yeah. There we yeah, go. Got my... like... Oh, the table name was actually right. It was just the print statement that was wrong. So that's even, <laughs> even better than that. And there we go. So that's, you know, the, 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 a basic example of the kind of thing we'd use Spark for is just building a, here's the generic steps I want my data to go through and then run that lots of times. Yeah. Yeah. And like when with you working in that, like I've got the same notebook open as well. If I click into something, you can actually see where I'm working as well. I can actually see where you are and we can work on this collaboratively. So I can bring in a new cell and I can just drag from one of those tables and run a, a select statement on one of those tables. And that's all just part of the same experience in the web UI. Sounds good. You, you can watch me come in and butcher your code. In real yeah. time. <laughs> nice. Do you want me to fix that spelling mistake for you? Yeah, yeah, that'd be great. That'd be great. There you go. <laughs> go in and fix everything for me. Lovely. Cool. Okay. Um, I mean, so from a from a notebook writing, from a Spark writing experience, it's it, it makes sense. It's kind of what you expect from a in browser Spark editor. It's got everything you you need. Um. So what are what are the things that we need to know about doing this and getting started? So just working with uh, the, the kind of data engineering experience, we talked a little bit about the lake houses before and um, how you're kind of storing the data and working with it there. Um, as you kind of demonstrated, you were storing that down as Delta and you can get that little indicator on, on the tables, um, which is quite handy to see. But just working with these notebooks, like you've got that stored as notebook one at the moment, but we can hit the settings uh, option up in the top left-hand corner. And that allows us to just rename it, add a description. There's some other components in there that we can talk about um, in a later video around like endorsement and scheduling and things like that. Um, so there's that flexibility to build out your real kind of ETL pipelines or ELT pipelines. Cool. Makes sense. Hit save. Oh, and actually ask me what I want to call it when I save it. That makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> cool. There we go. And then we go back to our workspace. Oh, I've got two yep. copies because I hit save and I made a copy of it. Cool. <laughs> yeah, so you've got that in there. We've got um, that workspace is kind of covered under source control uh, with Git, but that's still just kind of limited to Power BI elements at the moment. Um, it doesn't actually cover your notebook or all the other uh, components at the moment. Okay. Uh, and that's still in the works. Yeah, and that's absolutely something we're expecting to be seeing before GA, hopefully. Yeah. Yeah, cool. definitely. And if you're not, um, again, if you're not too uh, fond of the web UI interface, you can actually just open this in Visual Studio Code and it brings it down locally and you can work with it there as well. Um, so there's that capability. Okay. I think kind of uh, we'll, we'll go through the local development and how that looks in a, in a later video. So I won't work yeah. with that button just yet. Um, we know, we said we want to start to pull. How do we know that this is running on the default starter pool? Yeah, so let's take a look at that. Um, if you hit your, if you click on workspaces on that left-hand uh, menu, and then ov hover over your workspace that you're on just now, and just hit those three wee dots, and go to workspace settings. The, the ellipses. Brings... Sorry. We click on the ellipses. Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the three dots. Um, and if you go to your data engineering and science uh, section, you've got your Spark Compute options and uh, library management as well there. So your Spark Compute allows you to basically see that we're running on that starter pool. Um, and these are some of the things that you can control at an admin uh, level as well, where you can restrict people's ability uh, or workspace ability to create new pools. But if you click on that starter pool, you've got the option to create a custom pool um, or use some of the other custom pools that are available there where you can kind of say, I want a restricted number of nodes, um, I want it to auto scale or I don't want it to auto scale, um, those sort of options and kind of bypass that uh, default runtime within these workspace settings as well, because that's set at the admin level. Cool. But if you do that and you have your own custom design thing, that's when it's no longer using the... I'm going to start up in four or five seconds, Paul, is then going to start up like a traditional yeah. Spark cluster. So yeah. if you can accept yeah, the defaults, exactly. 
it'll go nice and fast and you'll have a great experience. If you deviate from the defaults, just you need to think about it like a normal spark cluster. Yep. Yep, cool. exactly. So you do uh, have yeah. some control over that. You do have the ability to change it, but the important thing is that you can come right in, you can create a notebook and you can start working without really having to think about these things. Yeah, yeah, it's fair. I mean, it's, it's hooked up. Having the ability to bring the lake house in and just start querying it is nice. Click, makes sense. Yeah. Cool. Anything else anyone needs to know before they can get started with the data engineering experience? It's, it's that straightforward, to be honest. Um, nice and easy to get, to get started with. Um, nice and easy to start working with your notebooks and bringing uh, your data across. So, Cool. All right. In which case, thank you very much for joining us once again. Thanks for taking us through the, the world of engineering in Spark. And yeah, we'll drag you back to look at the other experiences and deep, dig deeper into engineering. Yes, no more holidays, so I'll be no back more uh, much sooner <laughs> next time. <laughs> a, a fair and reasonable amount of holidays for you. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thanks, Greg. Okay, I mean, so kind of what you'd expect if you've been using Spark in Synapse or using Spark elsewhere. It's Spark notebooks with a decent development environment and the ability to hook into the data objects that are already in your Fabric workspace. All kind of makes sense. The only thing that you kind of need to get used to is that idea that you've got, here's all your tables, and here's all your files that aren't part of a table. So when you're browsing that files area, don't expect to see all the delta, um, all the parquet and the delta log and all that kind of stuff, because they're actually in the table section. You don't see that when you're looking at your files. Files are just things that are yet to be registered as a formal table. When you get that in your head, start working that way. All kind of makes sense, and you can start really, really quickly. Just build a notebook. Spins up nice and quickly, start running some Spark. That is the plan. So hopefully that's given you a bit of an idea of what the data engineering experience in Fabric is for, why you would use it, the kind of use cases that you have. For us, that is where we do ETL automation. You're trying to get a load of data through the early parts of your lake house. You're trying to say, clean the data, get it shaped, get it validated, get it landed into a place where people can then start doing curation and analytics and transformation on top of it then you can really easily automate that stuff using Spark. That's where we do the real data engineering stuff because it's just so repeatable. That's the power of Spark. Cool. So as always, don't forget to like and subscribe and we'll be back again with more Fabric videos soon. Cheers.